Let's pretend that you're sitting down in a dark room and you're listening to me with a bunch of other people. I'm going to do this slideshow for you talking about misty light and twilight paintings. I hope you'll take notes because you can replay this again and again until you understand it. I did work very, very hard and I've done the best that I can in this lecture and I hope it's worthwhile for you. Value is the basis for good paintings in misty light and in twilight. This is a value scale showing you from 1 through 10, dark to light. There are lots of different value scales out there. What I'd like you to focus on is that every single color has a value. Gray, the absence of color, has a value as well. And the value relationships are what are going to be very, very important to understand as I show you the slides of some of my paintings. Here's another value scale. This one is one that has holes in it conveniently cut so that you can identify the value of colors as you're painting. It's a useful tool. A lot of manufacturers make them. It also has the scale from 1 through 10. I'd like for you to take a look at it and note that even though they're upside down to one another, they're still going to be fairly useful to you. You'll notice though, in most misty light and twilight paintings, you'll find it very seldom that you'll actually use the last two, the lightest two of those values. You'll never see pure white and you will certainly have a lot less of that next value to it. And then I lightly shaded in the third red X to show you that that third value drops out of a lot of paintings as well. And so when you look at this, understand that pure white is a long way away from these paintings. Because misty and rainy paintings, the ones we're starting with first, definitely have a lot of lower values in them because overcast days create the cloud cover, creates a darker value throughout the entire scene. This painting is a painting off the coast of Northern California, done from photographic reference in acrylics. And you'll notice that distance gets softer and lighter. Look at the upper third of that canvas and you'll see what I mean. Shadows that are closest to the bottom edge are very dark. Shadows that are off in the distance are much, much lighter. So as distance increases, value contrast decreases. In other words, the relationship of the values decrease. In this painting, another North Shore California painting, I added a little light in it. So we do have some very light areas on the right-hand side of this canvas. And I did that for drama. It was an overcast and misty day. Uh, and it the mist was the fog, which is what we have. Fog and mist being about the same thing. However, the contrast is very high where the lit water and the dark mountain shape comes up against it. That's the focal point area. Now this misty light painting is done on location actually in Maine and there was a lot of fog in the air. Um, the grayness of the day increases also so we lose saturation of color in misty light days. Our color disappears as distance increases also. You'll notice that most of the distance in this painting and several more I'll be showing you have very little color in the distance. You can see vestiges of green and blue gray back there. But get the values again come closer together, higher contrast in the foreground, lesser contrast in the distance. Another painting from Maine where we have a lot more light, therefore we have a lot more color. However, the mist is still apparent in the distance, softening down the intensity of colors and definitely softening the values. The lightness and darkness, they are very close together at distance and the lightness and darkness becomes more contrasty as things get closer to the viewer. Now let's take a look at one of my favorite paintings. It was done out my camper window at Holly Lake, Arizona, where I love to go and listen to the elk bugling in the fall. This painting is interesting because in its misty light colors, you know the painting was done with the cool box. But I would like to point out to you that on the bench underneath it, you will see <laughs> a little bit of, I bet you can guess what color burnt sienna. Burnt sienna is right there in the lower right hand corner. It's the only warm in the entire painting. So by staying with your cool box you can see that you can create really evocative, really soft, really gentle paintings of misty light. Here's our first rainy day painting. 
this painting was done on location in the rain uh, in a plein air event in Riverside. Again, the entire painting was done out of the cool box. There is absolutely zero zilch, no, none, nada, zip, warm in this painting, and yet it holds together because of the values. Now, the wet pavement is the vertical strokes you saw me do in the wolf painting, along with the horizontal and other strokes in order to make it appear wet. It's an acrylic, about 12 by 12 inches. Um, one of the reasons I wanted to show this one to you is the values are very far away from white. They look light, but they are not. So I'm going to show you that with a little piece of white paper superimposed over it. Remember to keep your values lower when you're painting any kind of painting that has to do with misty light or rainy days. Here's another painting, Flabob Airport, another plein air on location, standing in the middle of the runway almost, or the taxiway, and I set my easel up. now. There is more light in this painting than there has been in the ones I've shown you before, but I pushed it a little bit because it really was a very cloudy day. Um, you can tell it's a light day by the cast shadow under that right-hand plane. I didn't use the cool box completely in this painting. Oh boy. <laughs> Forgive me. You can see it on the roofs of the buildings. The warm box colors are also there as well on, as in the sunlit areas of the plane. I include this painting because I fudged that foreground. It was not a rainy day. I made it look wet for interest. You can do that to paintings and it flips over and makes an, a, a generally bland area into a far more visual area of delight for the viewer. And making a rainy slick pavement is a trick that a lot of artists have built their careers on. I can think of a few western artists who've done this a lot with rainy streets and I'm sure you can too. So when in doubt put in a rainy pavement. Otherwise that would have been really a dull gray and very uninteresting. The next painting is one of my all-time favorites. It's now in the hands of an East Coast collector. It's called Secret Pasture. This is a misty light overcast day with the sunshine almost breaking through. The only warm area is a horizontal band across the middle just beyond that big trunk tree. Every other brush stroke in this painting is cool box. The variety of values holds it together. If you look off in the distance where those horses are, close your eyes almost completely and you'll see that those values hold together as being very associated with one another. They are not high contrast at distance. Think about this. Upper two-thirds of your canvas, start decreasing those values down to where they're almost neighbors to one another. Keep your high contrast for the lower third of your canvas and you'll be having a real good guideline for making good paintings in misty light and rainy days. The next painting takes this kind of thinking off the top. This is a small vertical 12 by 9, 8 by 10, I can't remember, it's an oil. And what I did was I was pushing the contrast decreasing to get the message across to students. It was a demo painting. I put those two horses in the middle distance even though they're in the lower third of the canvas and then beyond that point I just said mist, mist and rainy moist day and I think I nailed it uh, because I got the distant trees almost all a flat value. That's the guideline for this particular kind of painting. At distance the values become closer together, contrast decreases. I think I've said that. <laughs> And what better painting to show you the change that can happen in distance than this next little piece. This is a 9 by 6 by 9, 9 by 12, heck, I don't know. Anyway, it was done in Hawaii on the east side of Oahu. And those are the Pali Mountains. And I want you to look at the mountains as they go away from you. It's a beautiful transition in acrylics showing you how those value contrasts decrease. The next painting in the series is one of an overcast day done with Fay's barn in September when the fields were quite dry and it was a demonstration piece. Notice there are no shadows with any defined edges anywhere on the ground. That's a very strong characteristic of overcast days. Soften those shadow edges, make a little bit of a value dip when you have a shadow, but do not put a sharp edge anywhere and you'll be very happy with the results. 
In this hunt scene, it's an overcast day. Look at all the soft values beyond the rider and horse and the hounds. And also take a look at the shadow underneath the horse. It's a soft shadow. Nothing strong about anything. High contrast. If you look at the transition from the upper area of the horse and rider's coat down into the shadow areas under the horse's belly, you'll see that there's no sharp transition areas except for the coloration of the animal. So one of these days I'm going to finish this painting. <laughs> oh well, it was a fun as a demo piece. Here's a painting I really love for overcast days. This is the dog walker, which I did from reference material shot in New York City. I love this painting because, again, there's that wonderful wet cement. Anytime you can do wet cement, it's fun to do. I encourage you to do that. Uh, the dog walker, again, has no cast shadows. Look at the dogs. The only thing that's being underneath them is their reflections. On a true overcast day, you get no cast shadows. The poles in the distance, no cast shadows. Sure, there's some value change in the snow, but that was necessary to indicate the convolutions of the mounds of white stuff. Here's an overcast day with a little bit of punch. If you look at the brown and white cow, you'll see that there is strong shadowing underneath and also on the hide of the animal. However, the, brown, the black and white cow has not much high contrast. That white would be a lot lighter if it was fully in sunshine. Like I said, you really do get a chance to pull some value changes up. Make more contrast if you want an interested area. Make less contrast if you want a less interesting area. And you can win, win, win every time you pick up a brush. This is the Victoria Avenue painting that was the poster child for the 2009 plein air painting event in Riverside. It was a completely foggy day, overcast totally. The, the coastal fog moved in as high clouds. There was no sun. Ha! I pushed a little sun in the area that you see with the box around it now. Huh? <laughs> and again, I do that for punch. It just adds a little value contrast, and the only warm box that's in here is in that yellow tree. The next painting is one done at Holly Lake, and it was in the evening, although it was a slightly overcast day. However, I did a little punch, but with the cool box on the other side of the far distant shore over there. You can recognize those colors from the wolf painting. They are not the warm box. This is 100% cool box. If you'll notice the water, again, I'm not teaching you about water, but what the heck, here it is. Vertical strokes of the trees, horizontal strokes of the sky, and the reflections off the water itself. And bingo, it looks like water. So that was a freebie. The next painting is one I did in New Jersey while I was back visiting my nephew at Christmas time, and it's totally overcast, no cast shadows. Now, I brought up the values quite a bit because it was noon ish, it was midday, and there was a lot of ambient light. Now, ambient light, meaning the reflected light, the bounce light, can lighten up the palette of your canvases. You have to be careful. Snow tends to get that way. Notice there are absolutely zero zilch cast shadows. So that's what makes it read as an overcast day. This painting has gone into the hands of a collector. When I was in Hawaii last, I was out on the northern shore of Maui, and this is an area where you can pay money and go in and see beautiful things. And what was happening over here is we had a cloud cover, and yet there was enough ambient light, here we go with that ambient light again, to make that tea plant really show up with some contrast. But it was right next to me, therefore I can push that contrast a little bit, and it still doesn't look like it's in sunlight. That distant waterfall that's falling into that pool and the distant bushes and shrubbery on the slope up above, 100% cool box. The only red that is a little bit in the warm box is on that tea plant, and it's on that first leaf on the top right. Do you see it? There's a little tiny bit of cadmium in there, but not much. Most of it's done in the lighter edges or done with alizarin, which is your cool box red. And that's it for overcast days. Now, in looking over the paintings that I could bring to the slideshow for Twilight, I only had three, but that's okay because Twilight and Overcast Days kind of run together anyway, so you can go back and look at any of those ones that are presented to you in the, in the Overcast Days and make them read as Twilight. What is Twilight except the absence of a source of illumination? So in the first painting that I bring to you is, a, is called Winter Feed. It's sold, uh, it's an acrylic 24 by 30, and what I like about this is 100% cool box and the layers and layers and beautiful grays, the mist of the horse's heat and the animal's heat and the fact that these people are tossing hay off to these cows, these Herefords. So 
when you do a, a twilight painting, the light does not have to be in the painting. It is a time of day. Theoretically, this could be overcast as well, but I like it to think of it as an evening feed with no sunlight whatsoever. The next painting that I showed you, however, is a surefire twilight painting. The light is on the distant mountains that are reflected in the water below the two horses. I had fun painting this, and I really think of it as a dynamic painting because it's, the story is not just the two horses, but the reflections in the water in the foreground. And the lights up on those mountains that are covered in snow are not done with a warm box. This is 100% cool box yet again. I guess I'm getting old here sounding off so many times saying the same thing, cool box, cool box, cool box. But in truth, for misty light and overcast days, rainy days, whatever kind of day that gives you a difficult lighting situation, when in doubt, grab the cool box. And I finally bring you back full circle to the wolves painting that was completed in this video for you. And I hope you enjoyed watching it come to life and be lit the way that it is in twilight light coming in from the side. It could almost be evening light with a lot of bounce light on it. But regardless, I sure had fun painting it. And I hope you enjoyed this presentation of slides. The next one is going to be on advanced techniques. Are you ready for that? <laughs> That's going to be a ride. See you soon.